this is very important, this panel here, because there are, when there's a, when there's a dispute, Insurance companies are really, they're regulated by really three potential uh, elected officials or appointed officials in each state. If there's a civil dispute or a criminal dispute, it's a judge. Insurance companies are also regulated by insurance commissioners in each state. And they're also by the attorney generals. We've talked about that. And we went, we thought that this would be very, very important, especially after this debate, for you to hear from them, to hear from each of those bodies. So we went around and we thought, who would be the good, who would be the best that we could find to give you the interest? A lot of the things that you're facing now are a result, a lot of the insurance companies' methods that they're using now, a lot of those changed after Katrina because it was such a massive storm. A lot of things changed. There was a lot of new law. There was a lot of things that happened there. And so we want to take, you know, as you know, the Katrina hit Mississippi and Louisiana. So what we did is we picked a judge, an appellate judge, and I'd like to, I'd like to call the judge up first, Judge, judge Tiffany Chase. Judge, uh, judge Chase is an appellate court judge. Uh, uh, judge Chase was actually working with the Supreme Court when Katrina happened, um, and then she became a judge that handled civil matters in court after Katrina. Now she's an appellate court judge, and she oversees. We wanted a, a judge that had civil experience, but also that had criminal experience. So we thank you, Judge Chase, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I also like to bring up. Our, uh, we, an insurance commissioner. So the second we have the second longest serving insurance commissioner in the United States, Jim Donilon. And I will tell you that these two had, had issues with their plane because of the weather. And they both uh, got in at midnight to be here, even because their flights were canceled. They got in at midnight. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Commissioner Donilon actually had to fly to Los Angeles and drive all the way to be here. So it's quite, it's quite an honor to have you. Um, and the next, uh, next panelist, um, very, very proud that he is here uh, because he was the first attorney general to prosecute an insurance company for fraud. <laughs> attorney General Jim Hood. Thank you, thank you. And uh, if I could say a little more, you know, uh, Jim Donilon, normally insurance commissioners I gotta tell you, they, they go in and out of the insurance industry, right? Um, and the insurance industry is really there. So to have, uh, to have Jim to have you here is, is really, really special. Um, a few, uh, about a month ago, he helped uh, in, introduce the, um, and was there during our press conference, the American Policy Holders Association. Um, tell you a little story about Katrina, when Katrina hit. When Katrina hit, there was a, uh, it took a long time to get back. And Louisiana has a very, very short statute of limitations. Very, very short. And it was running out. And to tell you how much respect the insurance industry has uh, for, for Commissioner Donilon, Commissioner Donilon went on behalf of the states to all the insurance companies in Katrina. And he got them all to voluntarily, with billions, tens of billions of dollars at stake, voluntarily extend the statute of limitations for homeowners. And that, that gives you an indication. So he was also, you were the president of the National Association for Insurance Commissioners. Thank you. So we convened the panel because um, we would like, uh, we'd like to hear from you um, about issues of insurance fraud, things that you have seen. We, we all talk about, when we talk about insurance fraud, um, we normally always associate it, people always associate it with the homeowner or a contractor committing fraud against the insurance company. As we know, most, I mean, that happens, but there's also a lot of fraud the other way. And so, very, very happy that you're here because I want, we want your perspective for the contractors about what you have seen, and we also want to ask you things about what can be done and what you think in the future to curb this type of criminal conduct. 
Uh, you know, doing this civilly for a long time, and you know, I've been doing this now for more than two decades, and, and what I see is there's bad conduct, and the plaintiff lawyers, you know, they take the cases, and they sue in civil court, um, and then they, if they win, and the worst conduct, if they catch them with really bad conduct, the insurance company, the worst that can happen generally is they give the money back, maybe a little bit of attorney's fees. But as you, met, as you know, only 1% are suing. So what we're looking, we're looking at is the worst conduct. We understand that there's reasonable disagreements about things, and we're not talking about that conduct. We're talking about instances where there was actual criminal fraud on behalf of the insurance companies. So um, if you could, could each uh, give us some of your experience um, and, and what you see, what you've seen through Katrina, whether you've seen it getting better, worse in the courts, uh, uh, and, and the conduct, and uh, just generally your experience that you've seen. Um, I would say that it's very difficult as far as a judge is concerned because everyone's always on their best behavior when they're in, in the court. Um, but it's really incumbent upon the court when they start to see things from the lawyer's point of view that there's something that's just not right. A lot of times um, the adjusters um, or members of the insurance company may come to court. They may sit in court to kind of watch the proceedings to see what's going on. Um, a lot of the cases um, from Mississippi um, as well as from some of the federal courts have really shown judges interactive behavior in seeing that there's something just not right and calling the insurance companies to the table and saying, why did you do this? Why do we have two separate reports? Um, this just is not right. And in those types of situations, I think that the case management orders that trial judges give out to the, um, to the parties are very important in that they can get the information from the insurance companies. Um, and as far as litigation in Louisiana, we do have some penalties that can be imposed, but those again are civil penalties. And the reality of it is if you're gonna get hit with some money I don't really think that that is the impetus to make someone do something right. Um, it's cr criminal penalties. If you know that you're going to jail, yep. Um, and we were talking about after Katrina with with our with citizens and, and some of the people that went to jail. Those are serious implications. No one really cares about the fees and, and cares about the money. So the civil side of it really does does nothing. But you know what these gentlemen have done, really trying to make sure that the courts see exactly what's going on. Because as judges, all we can do is rule on what's before us. We really don't have the ability to actually go out and be the investigatory arm, which is what you guys did. So kudos to you. Thank you. And John, thank you for having me. It, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to participate in this robust discussion of things that I see here, weigh the pros and cons of every day in my job as regulator of insurance. And the first responsibility, duty I have is to protect consumers. And of course, the first step of that is to make sure that the insurers are meeting the solvency requirements the law requires. What I just said is echoed by all of my colleagues all over America every time I'm in a national meeting. Consumers are our responsibility, and the first step of that is to make sure they have the money to make good on the promises they made when they collected the premiums. But it goes beyond that. I tell folks all over my state that we're the better government, the, the better business bureau for insurance issues in our state. If you have a complaint, bring it to us. If you put a put it in writing, we'll give you their answer in writing. That's how we operate. If you just give us a tip, you don't get the benefit of that explanation from the other side, but you do get our best effort to investigate and, and pursue the license, the referral to law enforcement, whatever is appropriate when we have a valid complaint filed. Um, and as to fraud specifically, for decades now, we in Louisiana have had an assessment on the books that frankly expires June 30th, end of our fiscal year this year. So in this session, there'll be a bill introduced to reauthorize that, that assessment on all insurers, 
life, health, property and casualty, all insurers doing business in our state to fund a fraud unit, which is a partnership of the Attorney General's Office, State Police, and our investigative, fraud investigative unit. Only six, seven uh, employees strong, but we provide the insurance expertise to that unit. There are two dozen state policemen funded with, with, uh, with that assessment and several employees of our Attorney General's Office. But in addition to that, I have always had a experienced criminal law uh, attorney on contract and when I hear, have valid information brought to me of potential fraud on the behalf of a, a uh, lawyer, an insurance company, an adjuster, a contractor, whatever, anytime I get such information, it's sent off to law enforcement. And there's a good reason for that in my state. You, prob you John, know, maybe most of you do not, that uh, in the past in Louisiana, we've had three consecutive insurance commissioners end up in federal prison. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, I want to go home when I retire from, from my present position. And there's such a thing in federal law as misprison of a felony. If I know of federal law being broken and do not refer it to law enforcement, then that's on me. And, and I, I don't take that very lightly. I indeed am very, very aggressive in vetting with that attorney on my staff and then passing on in a confidential manner valid information brought to our attention. It really is a very useful tool and I totally agree with the pre uh, you and your, your colleague in the previous uh, panel, the fact that there is good and bad everywhere, in politics, in, in the media, in uh, insurance, and in the, the legal profession. And our job as regulators of insurance is to play that referee much like the judge, but ours is regulator, not decider of, of, of disagreements. Ours is to, to regulate this very, very complex, expensive, and vital part of our nation's economy and the lives of, of policyholders all over America. We take that very seriously. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and discuss these issues with, uh, with you. Uh, Insurance Commissioner, one, um, one question I think it's, it's important to understand um, because uh, in some states, not just Louisiana, but in other states, some of the policy premium money that is paid to the insurance companies go back to 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 units in the in the uh, insurance commissioner's office. Is that right? Oh yeah, my my office. Uh, that I took office 12 years ago. I had a 30 million dollar budget and 275 employees. Today we do more with 225 employees, and 12 years later, 31 million dollars than we were doing when I took office that first year. We've been through Katrina. We've been through the Affordable Care Act and all of the challenges of that. Uh, we have every aspect of insurance with with uh, daily uh, issues relative to rate. We're one of 17 states that have prior authority rate review authority over property and casualty uh, policies in our state. That's an awesome responsibility. We have six actuaries full-time on our staff that work in that area. Uh, but yes, we are fully paid and funded by not just the insurance companies, but agents, adjusters, uh, public adjusters, all of, of the folks we regulate pay a fee or an assessment or a license fee uh, to uh, fund the operation of our office. So one of the things, uh, Judge Commissioner, I know we have, we have talked about this, uh, we've talked about this before, but one of the concerns of policyholders um, who may be the victim of insurance fraud, carrier fraud, on the carrier fraud side, is that they, their concern is in some, some not yours, but in, but in, but in some uh, insurance commissioner's offices, that the insurance commissioners are generally, sometimes it's a revolving door where they're ex, they're ex executives of insurance companies, or they go back to being executive, executive insurance companies. And one of the concerns is, is that not enough fraud is being prosecuted against, against uh, carriers who commit fraud because the money that are funding the insurance commissioner's offices may be coming from that. So my question is, what are your thoughts in the future if we 
um, if we were going to look at that issue of how some improvements that we could potentially make to be able to have to, to where the funding that's being provided uh, could could come maybe from elsewhere. Maybe it's maybe it's from nonprofits like the American Policy Association. Um, certainly, we we'd be happy to look at that. Frankly, I I don't see that as a problem. It never ever enters our thought process. I've never heard it even discussed uh, whether or not we would be lenient on an insurance company because we assess them or, or charge them for, for regulation of themselves. Um, there are other concerns, the revolving door that you alluded to, much more prevalent in the appointed commissioner arena yes. than in the 12 yeah. states explain, like explain, ours. Explain that difference because, only, because that's important for you guys to know. Very important. In, in some states, the insurance commissioner gets appointed. In other states, they're elected by the public. And Absolutely. there's a thought process. If you're elected by the public, you're responsible to the public. That if the public is reaching out and, you're, and, and that insurance commissioner isn't doing a good job, that they could vote in a new one or and those other things. There are Explain only 12 of us who are elected. You mentioned when you brought me out that I'm the second largest, longest serving. Indeed, yes. I am. We, we think you're doing years. a good job. So. Well, and I'm elected. Yeah. The longest serving is from Washington State, the other side of the political aisle from myself, but a good friend and colleague. He's been, he's been in office a couple of years longer than I have. The third longest serving is from my neighbor next door, Mississippi, yeah. Mike Cheney. He's a year behind me. And that is significant because yeah. us electeds tend to stay around much longer than our colleagues who are appointed generally as cabinet members of their governor's office. They turn over every two, two and a half to three years. It's really detrimental yes. to continue, uh, consistency in regulation. And it does lend itself to the criticism yeah. of the revolving door. You uh, are the regulator for a while, and then you go into a next career of, of being part of the industry. Yeah, and I think so, if you, where you are working, you need to know this stuff. You need to look up who is your insurance commissioner? Who, who is it, he or she? Is she appointed? Is she elected? This is very, very important for you to know, to understand, and start getting involved. If you have complaints, to start sending them to, to the insurance commissioner, and this is one avenue. Um, the other avenue of being able to bring complaints, we've talked about it uh, before, but you know, in, in, and that brings me to the attorney general. Um, in Hurricane Katrina, uh, I was actually uh, working with, uh, I, I was appointed to do some amicus briefs after Katrina by our Attorney General in Louisiana. We started to see, actually, because of what uh, Attorney General Hood was doing in Mississippi. Many of you may, may have heard about the Rigsby sisters, the whistleblowers that came forward in Mississippi. And they were changing reports, a, a engineering report engineer would go out to a property, they would write an engineering report, that engineering report would go to a home office, and that report would get reversed or changed. And General Hood, he looked at that situation and he said, that's, crim that could, that's criminal insurance fraud. And he started something, and, and uh, why don't you tell us about your, your experience? Because what, General, what you have done and what you were able to do as being a leading force, of course, as you may know, was paralleled in Hurricane Sandy by, by, by the Attorney General in Hurricane Sandy. Tell us a little bit about what your experience and stu stuff was that way and how you handled it. Well, John, it's an honor to be here. Um, I have a flight, so I'm going to have to leave at 12. So if okay. I skip out, uh, that's, that's why. But, um, you know, I, I was elected Attorney General in 2003. And um, I tried the Mississippi burning case in 2005 in that summer, and the guy was sentenced in early August, and Katrina hit August 29th of 2005. Within days, I started you know, receiving calls that insurance companies were paying zero on slabs. And I said, surely they wouldn't do that. And, and I've said it so many more times since I've been Attorney General these 16 years, at, that, that you know, whether it be an insurance company uh, doing something or a, a pharmaceutical company or BP 
or Google or many of the other battles that I've had with these companies, I'd go, surely they wouldn't do that. <laughs> And then once we started looking into what, why they were denying these claims, there was about seven cases after Camille hit in 1969 in Mississippi, in Louisiana. And um, there were seven cases in Mississippi, and our law was crystal clear what the burden of proof was uh, on the insurance companies and the insureds. So uh, we began to start looking at, at were they actually following what our Supreme Court has said the law was in our state. And, and we found that they hadn't. And it, it wasn't long until we started hearing about these engineers that were brought into the state, and if they didn't do what they were told to do, then they would get fired. And um, then there was these whistleblowers, uh, two, two sisters who worked for uh, State Farm, and well, actually it was, it was a, a Remkus, I think it was a company, it was a subcontractor deal. But um, they had uh, seen some files, and one in particular that I remember, because I mean, all this litigation and years of battles that I've been through, you know, has kind of wiped my memory of a lot of these things. But one thing that stands out was they got a copy of a file that had a sticker on it. It said, don't talk about this file, don't pay this, don't discuss this. And in that file was one of those situations where they had forced an engineer uh, to reverse uh, their position on, on whether it was wind or water as the cause. So we started from that point, we began, we began a, a grand jury investigation, and um, uh, we had uh, people come testify. Of course, the insurance companies blocked up and protection of all their employees, as well as a joint defense agreement with the independent contractors that they had. They built a Chinese wall that they thought that could be, was impenetrable. Um, the, the, the private lawyers out there that were in litigation continue to provide us with documents and and information. We filed a suit. Finally, we got uh, State Farm and several of the other companies to go back and reevaluate claims. You know, my goal was to get people paid, try to make them whole as best we could, uh, rather than uh, send somebody to jail. Um, now, in hindsight, you know, uh, that would have probably been, been the best thing for us to have done because it happened again in Sandy. It's the same engineers that were left Mississippi and they went up there, they hired them. Uh, knowing full well that they had been involved in fraud in Mississippi because in the interim, there was a whistleblower suit filed by these sisters. And in federal court, if you, if you, if you note, observe something that uh, is, is a theft from the United States government, then you can file a suit and you get a percentage back. It's an incentive to people, contractors or whomever, who see fraud out there to report it. So these sisters filed a suit and it went on for years, but finally a jury in uh, federal court in Jackson, Mississippi found that State Farm committed fraud, literally committed fraud in providing false uh, engineering reports. Uh, they, they are, then, the, then the Fifth Circuit upheld that and, and, and ordered uh, the insurance companies to provide about an additional 500 files. So that's continuing uh, to, to, to go forward. Then I realized that we, the federal government gave the state money. It was a homeowner's assist, assistance plan whereby we provided grant money. Um, so we have actually gone back and, and sued uh, several of the insurance companies now for defrauding that program, that state program with federal money. So there's a lot of litigation still continuing here, you know, um, some uh, 14 years later. But what happened up it was Sandy, I, I thought surely they wouldn't do it again. Not after all they've been through in Mississippi, found to be have committed fraud by a court, upheld by the Fifth Circuit, and, and, and they did. And just a couple of days ago, there was a case that came down uh, in the Eastern District, uh, Federal District Court in New York, and the court found that some of the same actors had committed the same kind of fraud. So my, my point to you in being here is that, uh, it's what John's brought to my attention is that, uh, and, and Eric Schneiderman when he was Attorney General in uh, New York, is that uh, we don't really make cases if somebody doesn't report them to us. Uh, you know, we have all this technology, I've got a cyber crime unit, you know, we do catch a lot of people doing things with, with technology, but usually it's someone reporting something to us. And so it's vital when I think you go into a disaster situation that, that you report things that you're seeing out there um, to the Attorney General's office. And the way to do that is to go there beforehand. Go there before there is an event, 
get the consumer protection. If you get the AG in a meeting, great, but the AG is going to, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. And when there's a storm, they might remember it. But those consumer protection people are the ones who you need to be uh, talking to, exchanging numbers and things like that so that you can make that contact. And I just wish that we had something like uh, the, the APA back when I was having to deal with this during Katrina that could have, could have had a database could have had a list of, of engineers who have found to have committed fraud in the past, that they could have come handed us. And I think by forming this, thank you. I think by forming this organization, it will continue. You know, AGs come and go. In Louisiana, you've had, you know, you've had three since I, I started as, as AG. And, and um, so AGs come and go, but the, but the consumer protection offices, uh, they stay there. But this organization that y'all have set up, and, 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 and John, I applaud you on, on, on getting this started, it will continue. It will continue to have that communications with attorneys general offices, and we will prosecute fraud. If somebody you know, comes in and, and shows us two engineering reports, and then some type lie, that's mail fraud. You have so many uh, charges that you can bring if they send it over the, over the uh, internet, if they emailed it, those kind of things. And so we are glad to prosecute these kind of cases if we Absolutely. just cooperate. Thank you. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And uh, if y'all have questions before I have to zip out of here at 12, then I'll be glad to try to answer. Well, I appreciate it, Attorney General. And um, I know I've said this before at a different panel, um, but you know, we all stand on each other's shoulders, right? Work that was done by probably some of it's our parents and our grandparents and other things. We stand on each other's shoulders. And in the industry, that's happening too. And I can tell you, Attorney General, the things that you did in Katrina, the things that you did there, it reopened in Sandy because Eric Schneider and what happened, for those of you that don't know, uh, you know, we had the whole statistics after Sandy. But in that, in that case, I, my law firm, we funded about 80% of the initial litigation that was filed in that, in, in that, uh, in that storm. Um, and in that case, we found, I saw the same guys, you know, the same guys that were there in Mississippi, same guys that were in New Orleans, that, that were at public allegations of fraud, and here they are in Sandy. But the thing was, the civil litigation was so expensive in New York, we started losing money. I mean, I, you know, I, I, at one point, we were calculating I was losing seven to $800,000 a month personally, in that litigation. And there didn't seem to be an end in sight. And at one point, you know, we kept going back to the bank and Yuli and I, just my wife and I had just gotten married and we were at a point we kept going, we went back to the bank and back to the bank again and back to the bank again. And it looked like we couldn't go back anymore. And we were actually facing, I was facing losing my house too with my, uh, my clients. Uh, and there was a point where I thought I would. And then it just, I remember one night, I had actually spent half a night in a closet. I was so upset. And I thought, I didn't want to wake my wife, and I was so upset. And it just came to me. And I thought, wait a second. The, all this litigation. Wait, this is fraud. It's the same guys. What General Hood did, that's what I'll do. And, and because of you, because of the things that you did, it, it was an idea. We went to Eric Schneiderman. We showed him the fraud. And you guys may have seen pictures, if you've been to the APA booth, what happened? Guy in handcuffs. Uh, uh, and, and that changed, that reopened. So that this, that what you did led to the reopening of 144,000 claims. That's 144,000 families had the opportunity to reopen their claims uh, because of the things that you did, Attorney General. Wow, uh, thank you. wow. Hey, can we get a thank couple you. questions? Uh, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, and I'll, tell, I'll say also that that was also part of the impetus uh, with the APA. So those of you who aren't members now, um, you should be before you leave here. That, that by being a member of that, look, you're, you're busy doing your work. You're busy putting the roofs on. You're busy build, rebuilding. You're busy adjusting. You're busy litigating a civil case. You don't have, a lot of times these things aren't reported because we can't afford to do it. We're, we're trying to just, in, you know, a lot of times we get our money and we go on. We don't worry about that. But what you're able to do now if you suspect fraud and you remember the APA is tell them that, you know, we remember the APA. And the APA speaks to every attorney general in the country. So um, because of you, this idea was also born. And I thank you, Attorney General.
Well, thank, thank you, John, for your. For, um, we have a couple word. questions since you're, uh, you may be leaving uh, soon. Uh, we have a couple questions. For the we got a couple questions right over well, here. For the whole panel. Attorney General Hood, I'm, I'm actually a contractor in Mississippi, and I, I appreciate all the hard work you're doing with us and, and holding the insurance companies accountable. One of, one of the things that I'm also involved in is real estate, and one of the moves that's happening in, in our laws right now is that uh, we're, we're making it illegal for third-party liability lawsuits on, for land, land, uh, landlords. Sorry, I couldn't think of it. In, in other words, tenants can't sue me because someone does a drive-by on the neighbor's house and someone gets shot. Whereas right now they can, even though it's a frivolous lawsuit, it's still a lot of money and attorney fees and all that good jazz that goes through. And that's why these lawsuits come to play. One of the biggest problems that I think drive down insurance are, are prices in, in, in Xactimate from Mississippi, which, by the way, we are the lowest in the country. I've been 10 weeks in Denver this year. It's been six weeks or eight weeks in uh, North Carolina this year. We're almost half, according to Xactimate, of what a roof would cost. So these tactics of driving down prices, like... Uh, uh, not letting contractors speak on policies and, 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 tr and pursuing laws like that. Would that be circumvented if insurance companies were allowed to work and almost encouraged to work with us more? Maybe not be allowed to uh, sue an insurance company for recommending a contractor that meets all the legal requirements. And, 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 and maybe, maybe, you know, not being able to um, do that would, 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 would open up the doors for insurance companies to work with us and have actual preferred vendor programs that actually do something rather than going with managed repair programs that have that obviously drive down prices so is there a way that that is that on the table first of all in mississippi and is that something that you think would make a difference they don't have a lot of incentive to work with with you and i know a lot of you want to work work with them and get things accomplished and move on and stop all the bickering and finger pointing but they're making so much money. Take, it's 2005, Jim, you may have these more updated figures than I do, but I just looked through some notes. And the insurance industry had, uh, could have paid all of the claims in Katrina just from the premiums that they had. And in fact, that year they had 18% profits. Plus, they increased their reserves to $472 billion by, by 7% that year. So they're making money, and unless somebody uh, upsets the apple cart, there's no incentive, I don't think, for them to come to the table. Maybe uh, Commissioner Donnelly has uh, some suggestions that can better answer your question. But, you know, I, I think that what they understand is that um, all this litigation, uh, uh, that's just a cost of doing business for them. The thing is, 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 like in Katrina, they were dumping cost off on the taxpayers, um, is what they were doing, the taxpayers through the flood program. And, and so they will continue to do that uh, as, as long as uh, we allow them to do so. But maybe Commissioner Donnelly can better answer your question on some suggestions. Well, I, I, I did hear the allegations, and we didn't have the slab cases that y'all did. The coast in Mississippi was wiped barren. In our case, we had levees break. And so we had a, a watermark. When the water rose from, yep. the, from the broken levees, we could tell that Below six feet was water uh, flood damage and not covered by the homeowners. And the wind did anything above that. And in many cases, some of it was both. We did have allegations of shifting to the, to the federal flood program from the homeowner side. But I was telling the judge uh, just in the back beforehand, I had a colleague, a legislator, who was complaining about his flood adjuster and uh, said that it was being shifted over to, by the single adjuster to the homeowner's policy, and he wasn't being paid what he was entitled to uh, on the flood side. There's, there's certainly lots of room for improvement, and there's bad actors in every profession. I mentioned that earlier. But I was in the gym uh, on a Sunday evening uh, on an elliptical machine when the fellow next to me said, you're the commissioner, you might want to watch this, and it was the Superstorm Sandy expose coming out uh, on, on 60 Minutes. And like you mentioned earlier, uh, General, I was incredulous as to why that engineer, who happened to be from my hometown in Metairie, uh, uh, but I had never heard of him before watching that, that expose, what would his motivation be to defraud policyholders like that? And in addition to that, what would the motivation be for the federal government 
to do that to their policyholders. I, I just was disbelieving. But frankly, there were motivations, obviously, at work, and, and uh, the, the work that, that was done in Mississippi and in, in uh, New York and New Jersey ended up benefiting hundreds of thousands of policyholders as they got their, their claims readjusted. But, uh, but as to the, the question, what can be done to better communicate between those with, with a, a legitimate claim and, and need for assistance and the, the companies, uh, that is what we're there to do. If they're not communicating, that's against the law. Bring it to us through a complaint and, and we'll take it from there as the Better Business Bureau does with air conditioning repairmen. So, so I think one before uh, you go, Attorney General, um, and I think, and, I, and I'd like to ask the judge this in particular, and then Attorney General, I think you could also weigh in here uh, for both of you, uh, of course, Commissioner, if you could weigh in on it. But people are, um, they, there's a distinction between civil proof and proof of criminal proof. And there's different levels of that. And then there's also, people are confused as to what the definition, what would be the definition of criminal fraud in general? And I know we can't give people legal advice, but in general, what is it and what do you have to prove? Well, I'll tell you this in a very simplistic way. Fraud is doing what you know you ain't supposed to do. So, <laughs> and it, it happens a lot and it's intentional acts that are um, done upon a lot of the policyholders in these cases. And fraud, you know, you have civil fraud, and so you just kind of have to show a little bit. But if it's criminal fraud, you just think about the fact that you're going to be incarcerated. And it goes back to what we were talking about. You know, maybe, and, and hindsight is always 2020, but, you know, if those people would have gone to jail, they wouldn't have done it. Yep. It's a billion dollar industry. They're making money hand over fist. It's the cost of litigation. They're trying to continue to come to court. They're paying their lawyers. They're paying the same experts. And one of the th things that I was glad that the judges did in their opinions was actually name these people. Yes. You have to call people out. Yes. Because as a judge, if I'm reading a, um, an opinion that lists this particular adjuster or this particular person, I'm going to then say, wait a minute, this is fraud. And Very that's how point. these things come out. Because as, as I said at the beginning, courts really are only dealt with, they can only deal with what's brought to them. And so if all of the information is not really brought to them, we can't do anything. So as a judge, and you're sitting there, and whether it's a criminal judge, you've been a trial judge, you've been a, you're have a appellate court judge now on both civil and criminal, um, the fact that we have the case law, we actually have some of the people's names, can help victims in the future. Yes. With judges. You, as, as a judge, that would be persuasive to you. Well, it's extremely persuasive because I'm looking at, and again, it's intent. What did this person think that they were doing? They knew that they were doing it. And I know a lot of the people who were named, a lot of the engineers were saying, yeah, but these, you know, the insurance company hired me. And in their heads, they thought, if I don't write something that is beneficial to the insurance company, they're not gonna use me anymore. Exactly. But as, as, a, as a court, we can't really look at that. We really need to look at what are the facts brought to us? What is the fraudulent behavior or what is the bad behavior that was done? It's a lot easier on the civil side, and John, as you pointed out, lawyers are doing this. When, when insurance companies start to see that they're in trouble, they're gonna settle. They're gonna settle that one case yep. and make it go away so that they don't have to deal with the criminal side of it. Um, which is coming, and so you have you had these whistleblowers that came out, and you had attorney generals, and you had insurance commissioners who were willing to take the chance, and it goes back to being elected versus appointed. I think that you have a responsibility to the public and to the people that you serve when you are elected by the people who you serve. Let me just give you, a, and this is something for contractors, just a, a straight up rule of thumb, the difference between criminal and civil. Uh, what we did was the contractors that we had to prosecute, many of our home-based contractors, their homes were destroyed too. 
So they were trying to fix their own homes. And, and so we had some fly by nights come through and they took the money and ran. They never did a thing. That's criminal and we prosecuted them to the hill. Some of them that did some, some work. Um, and it, yeah, it, hurts, it hurts the good reputable builders when you have those come through. When, when they did a little bit of work and it, and it didn't work out, it got more over into the civil realm. Okay, under the Consumer Protection Act, we have both civil and criminal. It can be a civil side and it's $10,000 per violation and penalties that can be un imposed. And we have a criminal provisions. Of course, they're not just the criminal provisions on the Consumer Protection Act. You got wire fraud and all these other frauds. On the insurance side, uh, changing those engineering reports, um, uh, that, that's a little bit more gray area. If, if you have a pattern of that activity though, that's when you should, that's when you're able to, a prosecutor's able to prove a criminal case. Because the burden of proof in a criminal case, and I was a DA for uh, two terms and, and, and um, tried 100 jury trials or more, and, and you know, you've got to prove to a jury that beyond a reasonable doubt that this person committed this offense. On the civil side, uh, some standards are clear and convincing evidence or, or beyond a reasonable doubt is on the crim criminal side. So as far as a, a pattern, for example, if you see an insurance company uh, changing reports or they continue to lie, you know, it, it, it can very easily, if you can establish a pattern, that's when it moves over from the gray area, whether it's civil or criminal. Now, we were talking about the um, impact of civil litigation and, and we sued in Mississippi, I sued in 2005, it was 2009 before our Supreme Court ruled that we were correct. It was a hollow victory. Everybody had settled or they went bankrupt or they moved away. And that's the problem with the civil uh, side of this and the insurance companies have calculated in uh, those factors. But the criminal side is something I think in the future that we're gonna have to use to try to make sure uh, that, that they, they follow uh, the, the, the policies that they've written and pay what they're supposed to pay. And if I may, that's, that's the problem with your prosecution role and, and our role as regulator. Many times, and, and the real contractor fraud in Louisiana in the aftermath of Katrina, and then Rita as well, was contractors who took the money from, from the little old lady who... No, they took had, it from the judge. <laughs> well, too, also, but but lots of widow ladies got checks from Road Home or from or from their insurance settlement and paid somebody who probably started out in good faith, meaning to restore that person's property for the amount they agreed on, and they didn't know what they were doing, and they got in over their head, and at some point it changed from a incompetence that's not criminal into a I'm getting getting this money and I can't do it. I can't pay them back and I can't do the job. But didn't you see a lot of people who came in that they had contractors who were there trying to fix their own homes and then you had contractors from out of state that oh, came in, oh, got no with doubt. the reputable Storm, companies. Storm chasers. And it was really bad because the reputable contractors who were in New Orleans were getting together with these other people who were coming in or in Mississippi and then they were messing up their reputations. You had contractors in New Orleans that had A plus business, Better Business Bureau ratings, and other people came in and ruined their ratings. Here, here's they, one they, thing where, where that we are trying to communicate to to a lot of you know, the judges, insurance commissioners, attorney generals, is that you know what happens? We saw this in Katrina. We see these in these big storms. The storms are getting bigger, uh, more and more. When you have back to back storms like we do you don't have enough contractors in the local area. Absolutely. And so we talk about, you know, um, you know the, the, what the insurance industry wants to say is they want to say, well, anybody that's going and chasing the storm is bad, right? But we need, you know, these are, you know, uh, we have the, the Red resources. Cross that comes in to do stuff and what a lot of good contractors are doing, they're coming in from out of town. They have to come into town because we don't have them in town to be able to do it. They have to do the labor and take it, and it's more expensive and it's more difficult. Of course, you can get over your head, and I think that's an important point. Um, but, um, but in any event, so, so any other questions about, um, about what constitutes carrier fraud um, and how is that being looked at uh, by the various, uh, uh, the, the judge, the attorney general, and the insurance commissioner? 
My question's a little bit different than that. <laughs> There's a market failure. First of all, thank you for the three of you coming, at, yeah. coming here. We know that the three of you actually care about consumers. But what we find is in many insurance commissioners' offices that consumers make complaints and the, the agency will say, well, we're not a consumer protection agency. We're in the business of regulating insurance in the state. And so that not, leaves... Not us. <laughs> that, that, well, in a lot of states they do. I hear and you. that leaves the consumer with no place to go if they right. can't go to their own insurance commissioner's offices, if they're not going to actually follow up because they're so grossly understaffed in these areas. Well, no. So my question to you is, can't we um, address this with the NAIC and actually help the consumer out and maybe perhaps do in the other states what you're doing, Commissioner? Great, great question, yep. Absolutely. And, and, and the NAIC is how we regulate insurance. Just one, on one the, second. We want to thank, Jim, uh, Jim. we give it a round Jim, of applause just, to the Attorney General. Thanks. Thank you for coming all this way. Uh, Attorney General, we really, really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you all. Sorry, I got to okay. okay. Thanks. Indeed, great idea, great point, and, and we're very cognizant of that at the NAIC level. And state in, insurance is regulated, has always been, at the state level. Very complex, very expensive, very important part of our nation's economy, and certainly consumers' everyday lives. But it's done at the state level with bipartisan support, Democrat and Republican. The year I was president of NAIC, I was asked to come with a group of my colleagues, a small group, to talk about the Affordable Care Act in the Oval Office with President Obama. And he made the point from the very beginning, he said, as a state senator, as a U.S. senator, and now as president, I support regulating insurance at the state level. Consumer groups are ve vehemently in support of that, as well as company rep uh, associations, because it is where the most responsive access can be had by both sides, by insurers when they have a problem with each other or, or what have you, and by uh, individuals who have insurance problems. So yes, the NAIC is there to do just that, to coordinate this state regulation of insurance at the state level, but on a national basis. So bring it on. One last thing. Okay. Um, so I want to thank the Attorney General, Insurance Commissioner, Honorable Judge. Absolutely grateful for your service. Um, I love what you guys have done. You know, it just takes a very special person to step in that role, very challenging role. Um, my, my question is, in the professions, when you, have a, you hold a professional license as a contractor, a professional license as a public adjuster, or you hold a license, a professional license as a medical doctor, a, a lawyer, um, even an insurance company, you know? They have licenses to operate in a state. An engineering firm has a license to operate in that state. If any of the licenses for a contractor, public adjuster, attorney, any of these people ever, or medical professional, were to found for malpractice, uh, disbarred, committing fraud in any way, they would lose their license. When these insurance companies get fined, they don't lose a license. They continue selling. They can, depending on how serious and egregious the violation is. I have the authority to pull insurance company licenses, and I have put but mostly for solvency issues, many insurance companies out of business. I shouldn't say many. In 12 years, several insurance companies out of business, probably on average one or two a year. See, one of the things that we're trying and, and having... Thank you. <laughs> for, those of, for those of you in the audience to understand, this is so incredible opportunity to be able to speak, um, Judge, Insurance Commissioner, and, 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 and to have the Attorney General, for, for you to hear another side of the story because you're, you're very often hearing one side of the insurance industry or, 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 or maybe things that, you know, uh, Judge, when things come to court, you know, things don't generally get to, in front of you, Your Honor, certainly not to the appellate court, if they're really, really bad stuff because the insurance company will settle that claim. And so you don't generally hear, and people who are trying to rebuild, insurance company, I think a lot of them aren't reporting it you know, they're not reporting it. Now, that's why we're hopefully with the APA and other things, we could provide a better, more vehicle to be able to do that, to give people the resources to be able to no doubt, the John. reports. No doubt, John. I would venture to say, if you took a poll and, uh, of, of 
likely voters, meaning the yep. most active and informed 25 percent of our state's population, they do not know that they can file a complaint yes, with my department. Don't. Yep. And I tell you, after Katrina, we started in, in Orleans Parish what we call the rocket docket. And courts can put in place certain time periods to speed up those cases. So as the Attorney General said, there was a four-year window before a lot of these civil cases were heard yeah. versus on the criminal side where you have constitutional protections. So those cases have to be heard a lot quicker. Right. And so I think states can, um, to help the, the consumer is by having cases heard a lot quicker. And, and if I may uh, add, we talked about the NAIC. The NAIC also breaks down into zones. And I'm a member of the Southeast Zone, 13, uh, 11 states or 12 states, and Puerto Rico and the U.S. You're Virgin on the executive Islands. Executive board still. I, aren't you? I am, I am. We had a zone meeting and brought the law firm out of Baltimore, I forget their name that has for gener two generations now represented public adjust the Association of Public Adjusters, the oldest and largest such association nationwide. And they brought concerns and issues to us, much like the ones we're hearing discussed today, like appraisal, like contractor issues, like licensing issues, like bad actors that tarnish the reputation of that very important and valuable profession. It was a, a really, really valuable morning of my colleagues and I sitting in a small conference room, listening, looking at power presentations. I actually have it at home, uh, at the office uh, back in Louisiana with an eye toward legislation in this coming session that will start next month. So things like this are so helpful to us who are charged with protecting consumers and regulating this industry. All right, guys, round of applause for these guys. Thank you very much, everybody.